All right, then we're gonna go here to share screen. Okay. All right. All right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but we just finished talking about the Circopithecoids, and we just finished talking about a comparison between new worlds and old worlds, and we were about to talk about superfamily Homnoidea. Does that sound about right? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so superfamily Homnoidea, so we're underneath the Catarines. So the Catarines will include the old world monkeys that we talked about at the end of class on Monday. And now the next, what we call super family, the next super family is going to be called the hominoids or homnoidia. So homnoidia will include apes and humans. And just so you know, many anthropologists do not distinguish um, between apes and humans. Many anthropologists just call humans a fifth ape essentially. Um, and just know that that's not in any way meant to be, it's just meant to be a, a taxonomic statement essentially, because we are in taxonomic, taxonomically speaking, humans are the fifth ape. So the apes, the great apes include chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, gorillas, and humans. And there will be lesser apes and greater apes that we will talk about. But in general, apes are going to have a larger body size. They also have the highest degree of encephalization. So encephalization talks about increase or refers to the increase in brain size in relation to overall body size. So even though a, you know, an elephant may have a huge brain, they also have a huge body or, you know, a, a, a um, you know, a gray whale may have a huge brain, but they also have a huge body. So we're talking about the brain size in relation to the overall body size. So that's encephalization. So the apes, especially the great apes, have the highest degree of encephalization. Uh, the great apes and the lesser apes also tend to have arms that are longer than the legs. So for different reasons, for the lesser apes, they have longer arms because they use a form of locomotion called brachiation. And I'll show you guys a video clip about here in just a moment. But just know for now that brachiation is a form of locomotion, a form of movement where they're using only their arms to swing from branch to branch. So it's basically the opposite of the vertical clingers and leapers we saw on Monday. They're using only the, the brachiators use only their arms when swinging from branch to branch. And then the great apes will use a form of locomotion called knuckle walking that we'll also watch a video clip of in a few moments. Um, so generally along with encephalization, they generally have more complex brains and enhanced cognitive abilities. They tend to have increased periods of infant development and dependency. So even though all primates have high levels of parental investment and longer periods of development, it's especially true of the apes, especially true. So we have long periods of childhood. Our prenatal and postnatal periods are much longer than you see in other primates and essentially, and especially much longer than other animals. Um, we have a molar pattern that's called Y5. I'll show you a picture of it here in a moment. And all of the apes have no tail. We have the coccyx bone that's right underneath the sacrum, but we do not have a tail, an external tail. All right, let's talk about the lesser apes first. So the lesser apes include the gibbons and the siamangs. And they're called lesser apes, not because they're, they're lesser than or less intelligent. It's just because they're smaller. Uh, most of the apes are going to be large bodied. The only exception is these two species, the gibbons and the siamangs, tend to be somewhat smaller bodied. Okay, but they are the most skilled at that form of locomotion I was telling you about called brachiation. So it's kind of hard to see in these pictures, but I'm going to show you a video clip here in just a moment. But their arms are significantly longer than their legs. Their forelimbs are significantly longer than their hind limbs. And they have really powerful shoulder muscles. And they have really long curved finger bones. So those are all adaptations to allow them to be arboreal and to allow them to be very skilled brachiators. So they're using just their arms to swing from branch to branch. Uh, they also have really uh, distinct vocalizations. If anybody's coming with me to the zoo, we'll actually get to experience this at the zoo on the 22nd. There, there are gibbons and siamangs at the Los Angeles Zoo, and they vocalize quite frequently, especially when they have visitors. So we get to hear a lot of gibbon and siamang vocalization at the zoo. Um, the other unique thing is that they can be monogamous. Now, that may not sound unique to us, especially as Westerners, but amongst the primate order, uh, that is actually one of the one of the rarest or most unique forms of reproduction. 
okay? But they generally tend to practice what we call serial monogamy, which is a series of monogamous relationships throughout their lifespan, throughout their reproductive lifespan, I should say. All right, so let's watch a little clip on brachiation. So this is another really unique way of locomoting, of moving through their environment. So some key points on brachiation. Uh, brachiation is a form of suspensory locomotion. So essentially they hang or suspend themselves from the branches. Um, they'd use overarm, arm over arm swinging to move through their environment. They have very long arms and curved phalanges. Remember phalanges are the finger bones. Uh, Gibbons and the Siamangs are masters of this form of locomotion. And this form of locomotion is somewhat limited in the great apes. They are the, the chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, bonobos. They can brachiate to a degree, but they're not as good at it as the gibbons and the siamangs simply because of their size. All right, so let's watch a clip on brachiation. This one is going to show you gibbons. So this is a lesser ape. Yes. Yes. So I want you to really notice, so as you're watching this, notice the form of locomotion. How are they moving through their environment? Notice if they're relying more upon their arms or upon their legs. And also notice how the baby is involved. If you notice in all of these videos, I show you a baby as well. So let's watch this and we'll talk about it. This is Samar. He's eight years old. and lives with his parents and younger sister in a tight family unit. Gibbons are typically monogamous, and his parents have been together for many years. His father, like all males, has black fur and white eyebrows. Females are a paler buff color, like Samar's mother, clinging tightly around her waist is Samar's one-month-old little sister, Raya. She still needs a lot of looking after. As a baby, she's even paler in color. Her fur won't get its true adult coloring for another five years. The family takes a well-traveled trail through the forest. They follow each other in single file. Mom, carrying Raya, pursues Dad, with Samar bringing up the rear. Moving through the forest canopy requires incredible skill and dexterity. Samar's father is a real expert. His swinging motion is a technique known as brachiation. Gibbons have evolved long, strong forearms. Highly mobile joints in their shoulders and wrists enhance their fluid movement. They can reach speeds of 35 miles per hour and cover nearly 30 feet between trees. These graceful gibbons are the true specialists of the canopy. But Samar needs a bit more practice. Close one. For Gibbons, the occasional fall is part of life. The important thing is to catch another branch and keep on swinging. All right, so we have now seen three forms of locomotion. We saw the uh, vertical clinging and leaping example with the uh, shafaka, which is a type of lemur. Those are streps or hinds. The next one we saw was arboreal quadrupedalism. So we saw the example with the spider monkey. And then the next one we have seen is when we just watch, which is brachiation. 
All right, so brachiation is a very specific specialized form of locomotion that you really only fully see in the gibbons and the siamangs. It's limited. The, the greater apes can do it to a degree. But they're not nearly as skilled at it simply because of their size. All right, do we have questions so far about lesser apes? All right, let's move on to the great apes. All right, so the great apes include orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and some would say humans. So some of the unique characteristics we're going to see, there's a sagittal crest, and I actually have a gorilla here, so I'll pull it out so I can show you. So the sagittal crest is what I like to call the bony mohawk. So it's this ridge of bone that runs down the center of the skull. So the bony mohawk here, this ridge of bone, is actually the connection point for the temporalis muscle, for the jaw muscle. So for the gorilla, the jaw muscle starts all the way down here at the ramus, and then it's gonna tuck underneath the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, and then it attaches all the way up here at the sagittal crest, okay? So just for comparison, our jaw muscles, they stop right above our ears. They don't go all the way up to the top of our head. So gorillas, they consume a diet that is predominantly rough, tough vegetation. And gorillas have a body size of about 400 to 500 pounds. So as you can imagine, that takes a lot of veggies because veggies are what we call kind of low quality food items. Um, not meaning they're not good for you, just meaning that they have a low caloric value. So you have to consume a lot of vegetation in order to get enough calories to support a large body size and a large brain size. So um, gorillas, male gorillas have a very pronounced sagittal crest because they spend over 50% of their waking hours just chomping on grass and other vegetation, leaves, things like that. Gorillas will also eat some degree of fruit, uh, but they eat mainly vegetation. Um, orangutans will also have a slight sagittal crest, but orangutans are more frugivorous. They eat more fruit than, than gorillas do. Um, chimpanzees are what, what we call true omnivores. They consume a variety of vegetation, fruit, insects, tubers, and even some degree of meat. Um, chimpanzees, just like humans, will engage in hunting strategies and they will engage in meat sharing, which we'll look at in more in closer detail actually in, in next week's chapter when we go over primate behavior. Um, humans are unique because they are characterized by a skeletal structure that allows for bipedal locomotion. So that's upright locomotion on two legs. All right, so let's talk about the species more specifically. Uh, let's talk about the orangutans first. So the word orangutan means wise man of the forest. Orangutans are found exclusively in the two islands in Southeast Asia, Borneo and Sumatra. They are predominantly arboreal, meaning that they spend most of their waking hours in the trees. They also are predominantly frugivorous, meaning that they eat predominantly fruit. They also consume vegetation, but they are far more frugivorous than the, the, the gorillas are, for example. And they also have high degrees or levels of what we call sexual dimorphism. So remember, sexual dimorphism refers to differences in overall body size between males and females of the same species. And it can also be differences in physical attributes, like for example, the sagittal crest. So the male may have a sagittal crest and the female doesn't. The male may have really pronounced canines, projecting canines, and the female doesn't. In general, sexual dimorphism just refers to differences in overall body size. So for the orangutans, the males are generally about 200 pounds and females are generally around 100 or a little bit less than 100. Um, orangutans also have a pretty unique way of reproducing. So they practice polygony. It's one male mating with multiple females, but they are actually the only primate species that lives in solitude. So the males will essentially mate with all of the females that are within his range. So say his range is 100 miles. If there's five females in those 100 miles, he will mate with those five females. So the males and females live separately. The only exception would be females when they have dependent offspring. And that's very unique, very rare amongst the primate order because what have we learned about primates? They're very social. They live in social groups. So this is really the only primate species we know of that practices this strategy. Um, so that has also unfortunately led to one of the many reasons that they're severely endangered and threatened. 
they're what we call critically endangered. So essentially because of the reproductive strategy, the deforestation and habitat loss is even more catastrophic for them. Because as you can imagine, if they're mainly arboreal and that male orangutan needs to get to all of his females, because he needs to get to all of his girls, if the forest is cut down, then he no longer has a safe way to do that. So the deforestation is not only destroying their, their resources, their food, their protection, it's also destroying their way of reproduction. So orangutans are really crucially critically endangered, um, predominantly due to poaching, habitat loss, palm oil production, coffee cultivation, and wood pulp. Um, so one thing that, you know, I know sometimes this seems very far removed, but one thing that we can all do is we can take a moment to look at the products that we use, um, the food that we consume, the beauty products, the shampoos, the conditioners, the lotions, the, the sunscreens. And if we can try to avoid to the very best of our abilities, if we can avoid products that contain palm oil, that is one thing that all of us can do, you know, to try to, because there are oils that can be used other than palm oil. It's just that palm oil is one of the cheapest ones to use. So if we all try to make an effort to exclude palm oil from our diet and our products as much as we can, we do have the capacity to make a difference. All right, questions about orangutans? Nothing so far? Okay. There are also orangutans at LA Zoo. Very fun to watch. All right, let's talk about gorillas. So gorillas live in the forests of equatorial Africa. They are the largest of all the living primates. Um, they are also unfortunately very critically endangered. There's only about 125,000 Western lowland gorillas left in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There's about 12,000 Eastern lowland gorillas left and only about 700 mountain gorillas left in Rwanda, the DRC and Uganda. So just like the orangutans, they are critically endangered, mainly due to habitat destruction, poaching, um, also the pet trade. The zoo trade isn't really a predominant reason anymore um, because zoos don't really take, um, zoos do not take animals from the wild anymore. They have breeding programs amongst the zoos that allow them to keep the gene pool deep enough. Um, but still definitely there are uh, gorillas sometimes taken for the pet trade that's, you know, other countries that has led to their, um, the fact that they're so endangered. So habitat destruction, I believe, is the number one reason for both gorillas and orangutans why they're so endangered, because their, their habitat is quite literally being destroyed. They also live in a very war-torn, in very war-torn regions, so sometimes they are casualties of human wars as well. Um, they also have extremely high levels of sexual dimorphism, probably the largest of the living primates. The males are between four to 500 pounds. Females are only about 150 to 200 pounds. So really high degree of dimorphism. The males are double, sometimes over double the size of females. And the reason for this is because they have really high levels of competition for access to mates. Gorillas practice what's called a one male multi-female group or what we call a harem group. So that one male, that silverback gorilla um, with the really predominant sagittal crest and the silver back um, that's so famous, that dominant male is going to have access to all of the reproductively receptive females in his group. So that male is in charge of all of those females and he is the, the father of all of those offspring. So along with the one male multi-female groups, we tend to see bachelor groups. So we'll talk about a little bit more next week. But the bachelors are just like they sound, groups of all male gorillas that are kind of hanging around the outskirts. Um, and their goal is to try to overthrow the harem master. So those bachelors want to take over that harem group and then have access to all of the females and the offspring. Uh, gorillas are also unique because they are predominantly vegetarian. And that does sometimes surprise students when I say that, because of course, the really nice pronounced canines that you see here, um, you know, sometimes students will assume that they're carnivorous and they're actually the least carnivorous of all the primates. They eat predominantly vegetation, some fruit, but mainly vegetation, mainly, herb, mainly herbs that are found within their habitat. Thank goodness. So that, yes. <laughs> I know that'd be that'd be pretty that'd make it even scarier, right? <laughs> Absolutely, four hundred pound gorilla. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. 
And um, the gorillas, they they definitely, at least from what I've read about them, they really are very peaceful. They're not, they don't, of course, like any other animal, they will certainly protect their harem and protect their offspring if it becomes necessary. But as long as, as long as you're not bothering them, they're not going to bother you. Uh, but as you can imagine, you know, of course, since their habitat is being destroyed and they live in very war-torn regions, uh, many of them have grown to not really trust humans and you can't really blame them. Uh, so that's gorillas. Any questions so far about gorillas? Feeling good? Okay. And we will talk about all of these more next week too when we get into behavior. This one's more just kind of anatomically and behaviorally. How do we separate them from the other primates? So we will talk about their behavior in more detail with chapter, chapter six next week. All right, chimpanzees. And I'm so sorry, I did not put a picture on the slide for you. I will find one for you. Uh, so chimpanzees, anatomically speaking, are similar to gorillas, but they're much smaller, of course. Um, behaviorally, they are very different from gorillas. Like I mentioned, gorillas are essentially very peaceful unless you give them a reason not to be. But chimpanzees can be insanely brutal. Chimpanzees have very complex dominance hierarchies. They tend to be extremely male-dominated, more so than any other primate species. They tend to be extremely violent. They engage in warfare. Um, they have oftentimes been used as examples or even justifications as to why humans are sometimes brutal and violent and engage in warfare. Um, I'll tell you why that's not really a good argument here in a moment, but just know for now that they have been used as um, kind of a model for human behavior. They are uh, more arboreal than the gorillas. Uh, but they are, I'd say chimpanzees are a pretty good combo. Chimpanzees, even though they're more arboreal than the gorillas, they do come down to the ground quite a bit as well. And chimpanzees probably have the most diverse locomotion patterns because chimpanzees will brachiate in the trees, just like the gibbons will. They'll knuckle walk. They'll walk upright on their, you know, their forelimbs on the their middle phalanges. They are less sexually dimorphic than the gorillas and the orangutans. They have the, the variety of locomotion patterns. When they're quadrupedal, they're walking on their knuckles. We call that knuckle walking. I'll show you a video clip of that here in a moment. They can brachiate, and they can also be bipedal for short periods of time. Uh, but because they're not anatomically adapted to bipedalism like we are, they look a little awkward when they're, when they're bipedal. And that's another really cool thing that you can see at the zoo. You can really see them utilizing knuckle walking and bipedalism. And you can see that even though they're capable of occasional bipedalism, it's not nearly as efficient or effective as it is in humans. Generally, when you see a chimpanzee being bipedal, it's usually because they're carrying something for a short distance, whether it be food or a baby, or they may be using their hands to utilize a tool. Um, they're generally being bipedal, um, not, out of, not out of a natural form of locomotion, but more as a necessity to allow their hands to be free. Um, chimpanzees, just like humans, are omnivorous. So it's really just humans and chimps and, of course, human ancestors that are omnivorous, at least if you're looking at the entire primate order as a whole. They tend to practice hunting and meat sharing behaviors, which is part of their alliance and dominance hierarchy formation. We'll watch some clips of that next week. Um, they have group sizes that can really vary wildly. It can be as small as a group of 10 chimpanzees all the way up to over 100. And the reason for that is they practice something called fission fusion. So fission fusion means that they, they break apart into smaller hunting and gathering parties during times of resource shortages. So when resources are limited, they break off into these fission groups where there's, you know, say 10 or a dozen chimpanzees that are going out on these hunting parties and gathering parties. And then they come back together during the seasons where resources are far more plentiful. So that's when they fuse back together, okay? So we call that fission fusion. So the overall troop of, of chimpanzees may be 100, but then they break off into these smaller groups of 10 during periods of resource shortages. All right, questions about chimpanzees. All right, so the bonobos. Uh, so these ones are some of my favorites. The bonobos were once considered, you see they look very similar to chimpanzees. Bonobos were once considered to just be what they call pygmy or smaller chimpanzees. But further genetic studies have shown that they are actually genetically distinct. They are genetically distinct species. 
Um, it is possible there have been some instances of bonobos and chimpanzees interbreeding in captive situations, but generally the offspring are not fertile. So it's kind of like a tiger lion situation or a horse donkey situation. Even though they may be able to produce one generation, they're considered separate species because they, their offspring are not completely fertile, at least not in most circumstances. So what that means is that chimpanzees and bonobos were genetically separate for long enough to genetically diverge and become separate species. Um, further studies have also shown that bonobos are not actually that much smaller than chimpanzees on average. They tend to be a little bit more arboreal than chimps, more tree dwelling. Um, but the most interesting thing about them is that they actually use sex to negotiate dominance. They use sex to mitigate tension. They tend to be very female dominated. The females will collaborate and cooperatively dominate the men. They tend to use copulations frequently and they occur for reasons other than reproduction. And we know that because we observe them copulating frequently outside of the estrus cycle. So the estrus cycle, when they're in estrus is essentially when they're fertile. It's not when they're, not when they're menstruating. When they're in estrus, that means that's when they can conceive a child, conceive a baby. Um, so that has been used as evidence that they do not use sex just for reproduction. So really, that's pretty unique when you think about it. It's really just humans, bonobos, and dolphins that have sex, that very clearly have sex for reasons other than just reproduction. Um, so sometimes this is considered to be evidence for um, the fact that essentially there's there must be another evolutionary reason for it for them. There must be another natural selection must be selecting for this behavior or favoring this behavior for a reason other than reproduction, which is really quite fascinating when you think about it, because that's, of course, something that humans absolutely do. Um, we may be somewhat limited by it, by cultural expectations, of course, but um, really fascinating when you think about it. So maybe there's a lot that we really can learn by observing the behavior of both bonobos and chimpanzees because genetically speaking, they're both 98% identical to us. If you were to match up all of our all of our base pairs, all of our adenines, thymines, cytosines, and guanines, if you were to map our genomes right next to each other, we would be identical to both bonobos and chimpanzees and 98% of those base pairs. So that's pretty significant, obviously. Now, of course, even though we share a lot of similarities, of course we have differences. You know, I'm not trying to say we're identical to bonobos or chimpanzees. Uh, but I do want to show you guys a little video clip, um, and I want you guys to watch this one really carefully. This one's a little segment from a, it's a documentary, it's a PBS documentary on sex, and it's going to talk, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but this little segment we're going to watch is about 10, 12 minutes, and it's really going to compare and contrast the behavior of chimpanzees and bonobos. So in your notebooks or wherever you want to write it down, if you want to type it somewhere, that's fine. Just somewhere record. I want you to write down three aspects of chimpanzee behavior that you note. So three aspects of chimpanzee behavior and then three aspects of bonobo behavior. Okay. So everyone take a moment while I'm finding this. So write that down in your notebook or on a, you know, a Word document. You're going to write down three aspects of chimpanzee behavior and three aspects of bonobo behavior. And then after we watch this, you guys are going to go into your breakout rooms. And of course, you're gonna compare and contrast your notes and talk about it a little bit. But then I want you to decide whether or not you think chimpanzees are more closely related to humans, um, whether you think humans are more closely related to chimpanzees or bonobos. So essentially, do you think chimps or bonobos are a better model for modern human behavior? Is that making sense? Yes. Questions? Yes, yes. No, it makes sense. Perfect. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. It's about 12, I'm sorry, it's only about eight minutes, so that's eight and a half minutes. So make sure you write down your notes because you will be required to discuss this in your discussion groups afterwards. On the tree of life, different branches are often occupied by species that look poles apart. But sometimes, what separates species is more social than physical, as it is with our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos.
Chimpanzees and bonobos live in similar jungles in equatorial Africa. They look alike, live in the same size communities, and eat similar foods. Yet, violence is a fact of life for chimpanzees. Battles between neighboring communities are common. So is the physical abuse of females by males. Bonobos, on the other hand, are essentially peaceful. In all instances, bonobos are predisposed to make love, not war. So why are humankind's closest relatives so different? For 20 years, Richard Wrangham has searched for an answer to that among the chimpanzees of Uganda's Kabali forest. Chimpanzee society is horridly patriarchal, uh, horridly uh, brutal in many ways from the female point of view. I mean, for the young males, the late adolescents, it's almost a rite of passage for them. In order to be a, 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 an adult male chimpanzee, you have to be able to dominate all of the females. So that's rough from the female's point of view. They regularly get beaten up in, in horrid ways. Wrangham frequently finds himself in the middle of what, for want of another term, must be called a domestic dispute. The mofo chasing badly. Barbara's a young female, and she's quite upset about being approached by the dominant male for sex. She's only used, really, to mating the young boys. There's our alpha male, uh, Imose. He's not used to being denied, and now he's after Tonga. And uh, uh, his erection, his penile erection, his hair erection, he really wants to get up Tonga. At the moment, she's escaped successfully. Female chimps aren't the only ones at risk. Infanticide is thought by primatologists to be a major factor in the evolution of chimpanzee sexuality. As a response to this danger, females try to copulate with all the males in the troop. The grisly logic of infanticide is disrupted if every male thinks every infant might be his. Under this regime, in which the females are trying to get matings from lots of different males, then it's favored males to have these tremendous testes and large seminiferous tubules for storing the sperm. So uh, they can put in a tremendous uh, number of sperm, about five times as many as humans. It's very high quality sperm. If you look at human sperm, you know, the classic quote is from the vet who picks up a slide of human sperm and says, if this was a bull, I would shoot it. Um, but chimps, by comparison to humans, have very high quality sperm. And they can have uh, uh, five or more copulations per day. The whole thing only takes seven seconds, though. I mean, this is not fun sex by human standards. Bonobos, on the other hand, seem to find sex thoroughly enjoyable. For the past decade, Amy Parrish has been observing bonobo behavior at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. She's seen them go at it in every way imaginable. You get standard heterosexual interactions, which are often face-to-face, -face, the way they are in humans. You also see what we call ventral upright matings, where a male and a female will hang together out of a tree, suspended, and have sex. Males have sex with other males in what we call rump rump rubbing, where they stand and rub their scrotums together. We also see something among males called penis fencing, where males will suspend off of branches by their arms and rub their erect penises back and forth. And then a very remarkable behavior in which two females rub their genital swellings together in rapid sideways motions. So what's allowed bonobo females to establish such peaceful relations with males? Parrish believes the answer is female solidarity. 
by cooperating with each other and solidifying their bonds and reducing any tension that does exist, they're able to form alliances with each other and cooperatively dominate males. And this changes the whole balance of power and the whole social dynamic in the group and makes it radically different from chimpanzees. And why have bonobo females evolved a strategy and chimpanzee females haven't? It looks as though a relatively simple change in the feeding ecology is responsible for this dramatic difference in sexual behavior. The bonobos live in an environment where you have herbs much more continuously on the ground. And there are chimpanzees that live in similar forests, but wherever those forests are occupied by chimpanzees, they're also occupied by gorillas. The gorillas eat the food on the ground, leaving the chimpanzees heavily dependent on fruit trees. To get their share, the female chimps forage alone. Mothers, with their babies ranging in age from one to about five, can't move as quickly as the males. I mean, one infant is up here playing in the tree, and, uh, and a couple are, are nibbling slowly, and the mothers have to sit and wait for them. So it's absolutely typical that the males reach the big feeding ground first, and the males have finished all the food by the time the mothers arrive. So the mothers disperse away from each other and away from the males. And that means they can't have much opportunity to form bonds with each other. The simple fact that there was food available on the ground was that drove the evolution of bonobos. Rangham believes the catalyst was a long-lasting drought two million years ago in what is now Zaire. The plants and the gorillas that depended on them died. It was tough for the chimpanzees, but they could live on the fruit and the trees. When the rains and the plants returned, the gorillas didn't. Now the chimpanzees could get to the food on the ground. In time, they evolved into bonobos. It's been suggested that same drought forced our ancestors out of East Africa's forests and onto the plains. And once you had drying in a savanna area, then conditions became quite harsh. It was impossible for early humans to travel around in groups together in the way that bonobos do, and therefore for females to form alliances and dominate the males in the way that happens in bonobos. But a little bit different climatic history, a little bit different in our food history, and we might have evolved to be a totally different, more peaceful, less violent, more sexual species. Today, this theory is little more than interesting speculation. But the idea behind it is consistent with a growing but controversial body of scientific thought that claims much of present-day human behavior is rooted in our distant past. All right. Okay, so next thing, let me stop the recording here. Mm -hmm.